welcome everyone to Think Gin 2021. Uh, my name is Sonia Hook. Um, I'm the managing editor of Drinks Retailing Magazine, and I'll be chairing this event today. Um, in a moment, I will introduce our fantastic panel of experts who are ready to delve deeper into the gin category and take a look at the off-trade gin market of the future. Um, but as we're all aware, gin is a, a crowded category. Um, we know that not all consumers are loyal to one specific brand. In fact, probably a, a number of consumers might be moving away from gin a little bit altogether to, um, as other spirits are sort of shifting into the limelight. So all of that perhaps means that gin is having to fight a bit harder. Certainly many brands now come with an added message, whether it's about sustainability or ethics or charitable partnerships. And so this, this discussion today will look at whether these brands are paving the way for the future of gin or whether consumers might instead become a bit fatigued by what they could consider to be excessive marketing noise. Um, so the question really is, can gin be the spirits category that champions the producers that are making a positive impact on the world? So we've got a great panel here to discuss all these issues. Um, I'm going to move over to them, ask them to uh, introduce themselves. I've, um, Nick, I've got you on my screen directly next to me. Would, would you like to start? Sure. So uh, I'm Nick Gillett. I'm the managing director and founder of Mangrove Global. Uh, we're an importer and distributor of spirits from around the world um, and supplying mainly route to market. So all the uh, grocers and wholesalers. Excellent. Thank you. I'm going to go around in a circle. So, John, would you like to go next? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is John Vine. And I'm the spirits and ready to drink buyer at Waitrose. Um, and I have the responsibility of buying all spirits and RPDs. Um, and I work quite closely, actually, with Nick, actually, as so I know Nick, because he's one of my suppliers. And James. Hi, uh, um, I'm James Phillips. I'm the spirits and beer buyer for Jarabones. Uh, we're a wine merchant based in central London um, with eight shops, so a big retail presence, both um, uh, in the stores, uh, e-commerce with private clients, as well as having a um, an on-trade site as well. So looking after pubs, restaurants, all those sorts of things. Excellent. Great. Welcome, all of you. Um, so we're going to start um, really by looking at the current market and consumer shopping habits at the moment. Um, good to hear your views on that. Um, and the first question I've got is, um, what do you think the pandemic has taught us about consumer shopping habits in gin? Um, I'm sort of wondering whether consumers have become a bit more savvy at favouring producers and products that they feel are authentic in, in terms of how they're produced. Um, John, could I perhaps start with you with that one? What, is, is that something you've noticed at all? Yeah, I mean, I think a couple of things have happened. One, we've seen it, habits have changed throughout the last year. So at the start of the pandemic in March last year, we saw um, people moving into larger pack sizes, so moving from 70L bottles to one litre bottles, uh, mainly because they wanted more liquid, because we saw people's shopping habits change from obviously being able to shop in the supermarket to more online orders. So wanting more liquid to last them longer. And that wasn't just on spirits, but we saw that across beer, cider, mixers especially as well. Um, mm -hmm. And I think at the start of the pandemic as well, we did see a big switch moving more towards value. And when I say value, I'm talking about good value for money. So brands and big brands like Gordon's, Tanqueray doing quite well because trusted brands, people knew the liquid really, really well actually um, would be at a slightly cheaper price point so from other more premium brands. So we did see a sort of a switch towards the sort of more value larger pack sizes. And I think as we sort of went through after lockdown one, sort of lockdown two, and as we sort of came into probably prior just before Christmas, um, we saw what I call a lipstick effect. And that's where people were sort of gone through the process and actually realizing they're actually saving money because they're not traveling to and from work and because they're not actually going into a supermarket and then shop they're probably saving money because they're not putting all those good treats and stuff that they would normally put in their shopping market anyway and actually people are saying actually do you know what we're going to treat ourselves so actually rather than having that bottle of gin we're going to go for something a bit more special so we'll go for a more premium gin because actually it's still small in the value of schemes from a monetary sense but actually made them feel better about themselves so mm. we did sort of a move towards sort of more premium spirits 
in the second half of the year. Um, and interestingly, as we've come through the start of January, February, we've sort of seen a slight movement back away from that premium side again. So people are starting to move a bit more towards value. And I think there's probably a little bit of apprehension at the time about how long this third lockdown was going to last. Um, mm -hmm. more, more people being furloughed mm -hmm. and that sort of stuff. So probably more pressure on people's um, monetary spend. It's quite um, quite a, a jump in trends switching between value and premium. Sort of something that you know, if that's that noticeable for you, that it's hard to to balance out as a as a buyer to keep track of exactly. Yeah. I exactly. mean, I mean, it's been. I mean, the big switch is the the bit larger pack sizes, and I think um, probably affected more of my colleagues in like Louise and Beer and Cider, where they've mm. the larger multi packs, uh, and we chose because. A number of years ago, we actually took brandy one liters out of the, the portfolio. Um, it probably had a lesser impact, had a big impact on our own label range because that's where we had the one liters. But um, as we sort of come into the start of this year, we've definitely seen sort of that switching again to sort of larger pack sizes um, and that more value aspect. Mm. Um, James, can I ask you the same questions? You um, probably have a, a, a more niche range of, of gin in your stores compared to waitress what sort of habits have you seen perhaps across spirits and specifically gin yeah it's interesting i think we have um broadly seen the same kind of lipstick <laughs> effect in stores as well i mean we're starting off from a, a bit more of a kind of luxury base um but so at the beginning of the pandemic seeing customers continue their faith in the larger brands and then as kind of following what John says, um, trading up a little bit more. Um, and even though there's been a kind of little bit of a dip off in that over the last month or so, it's still retained, it's still, it's staying at a relatively a high level. Um, our gin range is quite small. It's kind of dictated by the space we have in store um, to, to shelf spirits. So we, it's, it's been tricky to kind of um, maintain a balance between uh, ensuring that all the big brands are stocked um, as well as ensuring there's um, you know smaller more artisan niche producers uh, to to cater to those customers who are interested in finding um, drinking gins that are from different botanicals or different styles from from different places throughout, throughout the UK um, and abroad I think that there has been a much greater interest in those types of products over the last year than there was previously. Um, we've seen customers as well as willing um, to spend a little bit more on each bottle as 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 Johnny as John says, they're not they don't have the additional like everyday expenses from commuting in and all those sorts of things willing to try and kind of treat themselves a little bit more. We have seen them just kind of follow their their interests um, a lot more um, and that's you know, probably partly because of the the kind of um, people making cocktails at home. So investigating different kinds of aperitifs, uh, different kinds of spirits. And that has maybe that confidence to do that has actually come off the back of this uh, gin boom that we've been seeing over the last five to 10 years, where it's opened up consumers' eyes to the, the variety of, of spirits that are available and kind of broken down the barriers for, for them to kind of experiment, I think. Excellent. And um, Nick, with, with the, the retailers that you've worked with, have you seen similar trends yourself? Through um, yeah, I mean, we, we're in a, we're in the premium sector, but if you look at the sector, if, if you look at drinks in general, but you, you look at gin specifically, um, uh, it, it changed throughout the pandemic. So on, online was an absolute boom for, um, for all sorts of drinks brands, uh, smaller brands, because local people could spend time online. People had time for the first uh, time. So they did a bit of research. They bothered to find out some in interesting things. They asked lots of questions. They went online tasting, and this was good. Um, but you're, you know, it's devastating for smaller brand owners because your pandemic, you were limited. You didn't go to any bars. There were no bartenders communicating things that were going on. So unless you had a good web presence, unless you were lucky enough to be listed with one of the retailers, it's quite difficult to get a message across. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think the pandemic did change habits. We saw a lot of people moving back to 
what I would call unconscious purchase. They just bought stuff they recognized. Now, I'll just buy that because I know I need something. I recognize the brand name and I trust it um, and perhaps didn't spend time exploring. There was less shelf dwell time, I would suggest. Um, so um, there has been a change in habits. There were some good habits that people went to as well. You know, they bothered to find out and research some brands and, and bought on that basis. We'll have to see how much of that lasts when everything comes back to normal. Um, I'm not so surprised by the softening, I think, in, in, in demand now. I think people are waiting to, for life to open up again. Um, and, I, and I guess the, the case will be for both on and off trade, um, at the moment, you've got no back bar for brands to be on because you can't be inside um, and you've got limited space, even in, in, in retailers that have a wide range of gym. Um, John's probably got the widest. Um, it's still a fraction of the brands on the market. So it's tough. It's tough out there um, to get that consumer time. <clears throat> You know, in our, we, we did a Think Insights Day, which was about all spirits earlier this year. And um, the data from that um, showed that UK consumers are, well, it, it, it indicated that they're sort of more ed educated about spirits than, than others around the world. And this sort of desire to learn increased during lockdown. Do, do you think that um, perhaps was, was le not so much uh, the case in gin so you're talking about you know trusted brands and um as, as james pointed out mixology was one of the areas that people wanted to learn about but perhaps mm. maybe that wasn't so relevant for gin um as other brands other categories um i i, I think people knew probably had a bit more of an understand or think they have more of an understanding about gin um than perhaps some other categories um and I think, I think people were, there was certainly a massive move to making cocktails at home and ingredients thereof. And, and people picked up on some of the great communication work that brands themselves did on, and, and some you know, personalities and TV and stuff that was there. Um, I, I think the issue with gin perhaps is such a wide category. Um, the word gin seems to be slapped on a multitude of liquids um, which you can depends on your standpoint, but I'm I'm very much um, not all of those deserve to be called gin. Some of those are, a, 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 are not a fair reflection on the, the great quality in the category. Um, but but in general, I think it's a category that people thought they knew more about. Um, and I, and I think some other categories were a bit more surprising. And I think if you end up buying a bottle for a particular cocktail or something, then you think, oh, how do I use the rest of this? Um, so I, I think there's some experimentation there. I think there was some other research which went on about what consumers were also doing. So they did try and support local because people had to get out and about. So they were buying from their butcher and their greengrocer and they would buy local spirits where they could. Um, and that obviously varies around the country. And there was a piece of research that was saying, you know, during the midst of pandemic, people were trying to be sustainable and ethical. Maybe they felt vulnerable or not. So they were also looking for brands that had a message. Um, and that went across all sorts of spirits brands. That just wasn't was gin. And we, we saw elements of all of that. Um, and, you know, a number of those good traits would be be nice to stay around when we're all out normally again. Just avoiding the noise of my doorbell, so I had to put my mute on there. Um, so, but just to ask um, John the, um, the same sort of question about education, because I know Waitrose is... is um, has done a lot uh, virtually in terms of education and, and using your website. Do you, do you think that um, it's something that people wanted to learn about for the gin brands that you stock about the, the backstory and the botanicals and the people behind the product, or was it perhaps ha a harder category for that to be relevant for? Well, I mean, I, I, I mean, I still think in Waitrose anyway, there's still quite a big following for gin, um, and. At the start of the pandemic, definitely, we, we saw, you know, strong growth in both what I class as traditional gin and flavoured gin. And actually, interesting, when we start talking about the, and Nick touched on that, you know, the rise of people making, and James talked about it, about the rise of people making cocktails and becoming mini bartenders at home. The fact that we saw, you know, vermouth and Campari grow by such a, a disproportionate amount versus the category, sort of indicated people were making Negronis and making Negronis with gin. So um, there was obviously still interest within the gin category in Waitrose. I suppose, a bit like Nick said, you know, 
we've seen a couple of things. One, we saw um, our local and regional range in Waitrose outperform by our, I suppose, our growth within spirits. And again, that's where people were probably more limited from a travelling point of view, so they couldn't travel as far and were shopping local. Um, so we, we saw a, a big benefit there. And we have, I don't know, probably over 30, 40 local and regional gym products uh, within our range. So um, we saw, um, across the country as well. So we saw some strong growth there. Um, and I know from a um, cocktail point of view, you know, the, I, can't, I can't remember what the stats were, but it was, I think cocktails was one of the biggest search items on Google. Um, and from like, all that, the, the different virtual experiences that we've done, you know, I've done a number of ones. I did with Chris Norris last year with Reserve, Master Distiller. Um, did one re um, end of last year with Mark um, Thompson, the brand ambassador for Glenfiddich. Did one at St. Patrick's Day with Alex, the co-founder of Slain Irish Whiskey. So we've done a number of different virtual events um, at different times of year. Um, you know, whether it be Grand Father's Day, St. Patrick's Day, you know, leading up to Christmas and stuff. And the interest has been astonishing. I mean, most of the webinars we've done, we've had anywhere between 250 and 300 people uh, log in. Mm. And the good thing about them is the retention rate as well. So often you might get 250 people log in, but actually by the end of the 45 minutes an hour, you might only have 50 people left. The retention rate's been around like 90, 95%. Mm. People are really engaged in those conversations and those talks. Mm. Uh, so that's been really pleasing to see. I have a lot, or we've just got the subject matter right. I'm not quite sure, but um, we've seen people seem to be really, really engaged in them. Mm. Um, and we've seen it. I mean, cocktail ingredients and weight tries plus 90% for uh, 2020. Um, you know, rum up massively, um, mm. tequila up 90%. Um, and again, I think a lot of these things were the drinks that historically have had a really strong entree presence like rum and tequila, but haven't really broke into the off trade, as it mm. were. And actually what the pandemic has actually done is meant that people have actually gone home, researched more and come to the retailers and purchased those products. Mm. And actually we've seen some really strong engagement in it. So mm. from our point of view, we've seen sort of some, some benefits and negatives, but overall the interest, I don't think it's going to go away. I think it's one of those things because the pandemic has been going on for such a long time, it's become part of people's repertoire. Mm. Um, and we just need to make sure that they, you know, learn more when they go back out the on trade and actually, have more engagement with bartenders and um, sommeliers and stuff like that, and actually then go back and actually research more and hopefully buy more from us as well. Mm. So um, I mean, that sort of reflects um, back to what I was saying earlier on that perhaps um, gin is having to make a little bit more noise in order to, to compete with those categories that have now grown through the off trade, as you're saying. So tequila and rum, which um, may have, been a bit more swayed to the on trade before is now something that people are increasingly buying through through their local shops and stores um and so so we sort of move on to talking about these brands that are making a bit more noise in gin um there are brands offering to donate a percentage profit to charitable causes or they claim to be made using local organic botanicals or other claims that they're having a positive impact on the world so what, what do you as retailers and distributors, importers look for? What, what sort of sustainable and ethical messages would help you stock a gin brand? And is it also, second part to this question, is it hard to identify ones that are genuine while also being a quality product? So I'll, move, I'll, I'll just bring you here in, James, because um, it, it, it's perhaps your turn to, to hear what you've been up to. What, what would you look for in in gin? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of... It's a difficult question to answer, actually. I think that um, the breadth of the, the gin category as a whole um, and the, the variety of, of you know, origin stories and, and narratives that, that come from these brands make it very difficult to really, um, for, for the consumer more so, but make it very difficult to identify the really key factors that make it a quality product or make, make an authentic product, whatever the authenticity means in that respect. Um, I think when we're looking at various gin brands, um, we are looking for transparency first and foremost um, to understand, you know, where, like, where the ingredients come from, and also kind of understand um, what impact that producer has in each stage of the kind of uh, production process, whether that's making the base 
distillate the base spirit themselves, you know, using local ingredients or sourcing ingredients from sustainable um, suppliers. I think that's, you know, th there being a kind of transparency is, is the main thing for us. Um, when, it, when it comes to looking at brands that have a, a really strong focus on sustainability, I think it's likewise a difficult subject um, because there's no sort of established or regulatory meaning to what is sustainable, what is an eco-friendly brand or, or these things. So when, the, you know, there, like you mentioned, there's various brands that are planting a tree for every bottle or donating a certain percentage of the profits to environmental initiatives. I think it's, I think it's difficult to know whether that is the kind of right thing to do. I, I don't know if that sounds contentious, but you know, in the past couple of weeks, we've seen um, Marks and Spencers commit to, what was it? Um, putting in place a whole load of different honey beehives throughout the UK. And there's been a backlash on that because it actually potentially negatively in, impacts the biodiversity of those specific uh, the, the areas in which those hives are gonna be placed. So I think there's a conversation to be had about you know, is just planting trees for every bottle or, it, you know, sort of these initiatives, which are effectively sort of carbon offsetting initiatives, whether they're actually the right thing to do and the right thing to support. I think, um, I think from my perspective, it is just looking for a kind of transparency from, from the producer and knowing that they're not sort of doing anything egregiously bad, you know, that they are, um, taking part in various kind of ethical practices, whether that's, you know, paying on a living wage for their staff, looking after wastewater, like all these sorts of factors. I think that the sustainable aspect is like a, a very broad ethical sort of imperative that needs to take place. It needs to include action points all through the kind of business. So yeah, transparency for me is, is, is absolutely key. And that enables us not just to understand the producer, um, or the brand, but also communicate that to the customers. Thankfully, we have, you know, eight shops, very strong staff who are able to engage with customers on a very personal basis and communicate those stories. Um, so, yeah, for us, transparency, absolutely key. Excellent. And uh, Nick or John, do either of you want to um, answer the same question? Shall I go first, Nick, or? You go first, John, yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, I. I I think James has articulated it exceptionally well. I mean, there's not really much to add apart from, I suppose, from our point of view, there's, I suppose, the only thing that we've seen emerging recently that you could, I suppose, have some reassurance is B Corp. Uh, and, you know, and the one that springs to mind recently is obviously the Brookhead Distillery in Isla and getting B Corp. So the botanist gin is an example. Uh, you know, and I, having been to Ireland, having been to the distillery and, and actually spent time with the forager, he goes out and actually finds the botanicals and sources the botanicals. Um, in my head, you know, when, when we're lucky enough to be able to go and see stuff like that, experience stuff like that, that gives you reassurance that, you know, even big brands like Remy Quantre are doing things <coughs> and doing things in the way it should be done. <coughs> and, but it goes back to basically doing your research and understanding the, the facility that, or the distillery or the producer that you're working with you know, you know, are they are they making their own grain spirit? You know, so if they are, what's happening to the waste grain? You know, is it going into animal feed? What's happening to the wastewater? Um, and as James said, it's not just then about the botanicals and what they're sourcing because there's other things that they could be doing. You know, what's their carbon footprint? You know, um, I think you know, you know, you look at something like Brookies Gin actually in, in Australia. You know, what they've done and actually through deforestation and basically rebringing back the rainforest and actually sourcing the botanicals from the rainforest. Absolutely fantastic from a from an eco point of view. But is it right for, to be bringing gin then all the way over from Australia to the UK from a carbon footprint point of view? So mm. I suppose <laughs> there's all these different questions and things that you have to look at. And there's never a right or wrong answer, unfortunately. Um, but what you have to look at is actually, one, are they making a good liquid? Because actually, they could be really ethical and do be doing the most amazing thing. Actually, if the liquid is horrible, it's not going to sell. So actually, you've defeated the object straight away there anyway. So, as James said, there's, there's, you know, we have to do best with the information that we're given. 
Um, and you know, sometimes we might get it right, and sometimes we might get it wrong, unfortunately. And do, do, do you think that if you if you find a product that you believe in, um, <clears throat> as, as you were giving good examples there, John, um, do, but do you think those sort of claims and messages are resonating with consumers once you're able to do your best to pass that education piece along? But is it is it what consumers are really buying into? I'll, I'll be honest, um, from previous experience in other categories, uh, and you know, I, I spent a lot of time in uh, in Waitrose looking after canned goods and you know, looking at fish sustainability in tuna as an example. And it's interesting because you go to a lot of panels and what customers actually say and then what they actually do tend mm. to be two completely different things. And yeah. as soon as, you know, in the canned tuna example, as soon as they realise they'd have to pay another 40p for a canned tuna, um, you know, you, you could see it in people's shopping patterns, the, the, the decisions they were making. They were going for the cheaper product. So I, 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 it's a difficult one. Um, yep. you know, all you can do is make sure you convey the messages, you educate the consumers, and we do that for our, you know, our magazines, our, you know, our webinars, um, Waitress Food, um, Waitress Weekend, etc. And we we basically give the we give the information to the customers. They can then make the decisions. Excellent. And um, Nick, um, I know that you're careful about which products you add to your portfolio there at Mangrove. Um, can yeah. I ask the same question to you? What, what is it that you're looking for? Uh, I, I mean, ultimately, I'm looking for a great liquid that the other two people on this call are hopefully going to list. I mean, you yeah. know, commercial success is, is one thing. I, I, I do think there's a big difference. And I would like to think and I can see perhaps some early signs slightly from products that aren't necessarily in retail yet uh, that consumers are beginning to make some choices and there are some great examples out there and I'm, in, I'm involved with a business which is called Eco Spirits which is, is is exactly about this right it's about making positive difference but if you look in gin specifically um, you, you fall into a number of different categories so there are those brands that have been set up around a cause and it's intrinsic to their well-being so something like Elephant Gin which is about uh, protecting elephants and, and they invest in rangers and uh, land and, and it, all around that one species that's their dna that's what they believe if you look at somebody like warners you know they are about field to bottle this is what they've been trying to do using local botanicals and they've been banging on this drum for a long long time and then uh, there's lots of brands who who will have special editions for a particular charity and, and again i don't think you can knock any of those I think the danger is that there are a lot of people greenwashing in terms of what they do or ethics washing or whatever else you want to do. So they have bad practices either in their gin business or in another part of their business, but they hold this one up because it's easy. And I think ultimately consumers, and they do need to vote with their wallet. It's no good just saying it, but ultimately I think given the choice and the right information out there, then, then it will do it. And, and it's funny, it's, you know, I, I'm a big fan of the smaller distiller and everything else, but it's quite difficult for gin and botanicals. Some of these botanicals come from some far off places in the world. And then I think you come back to James's point and you look at something like FAIR, which is all about fair trade. And that's about paying the people properly and using good practice in the areas where these are cultivated. We can have a conversation about carbon footprints post that but if you're going to use those botanicals and they they're grown to the right quality in one part of the world then you need to make sure that you're protecting that part of the world and you're investing properly um and it is coming i mean whether gin and alcohol in general is behind it or not you know nestle who are the biggest user of palm oil in the world one of the most destructive things made a big announcement at the weekend that they're looking at it and that's come through consumer pressure so um you know, I would like this call in how many years it is, sooner better, where, you know, Jeroboam's and Waitrose are saying, well, actually, yeah, hunt everything in our line is ethical and sustainable because it has to be, otherwise it doesn't sell. And then the conversation is, is returned. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's a, it's, it's a commercial free market out there. And so the trends are coming. Um, but I totally agree. Transparency is key. Um, there's probably bigger arguments around artificial flavors and sugars and additives in gin and, and various things to be had initially because that's just you know a minefield for for a consumer as it is um 
and, and and hopefully these things can all go in hand in hand. But I, I, I do think transparency and the opportunity for consumers to find out more is probably a good starting point. Excellent. And I mean, do, do you think that um, if we did sort of moving forward a few years and we're, we're at that position that you're um, talking about that, that you would like to be in and and that spirits is, is really spirits producers are really looking at all of those things do you think gin's in a good position to to sort of play play a good part in the market because of the botanical story i mean you, you talked about the difficulty with botanicals but could it be an opportunity that it could be a kind of selling point for sustainability because of um, its ingredients yeah, I, I, every every category has the same same opportunity. I mean, there's, there's there's issues around the base spirit, which was being spoken about. There's issues around transport costs. Um, it, gin gin doesn't have a appellation in the same way that some other things in terms of bottling in 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 far off country. So, you know, it can be bottled here. I think the use of glass materials. Um, I think one of the challenges is the local botanical part is easy. That's easily solved. And actually, to a certain extent, if people put their mind to it, green energy and so on and so forth is easily solved. Um, and you can see some big companies doing good stuff. The, the challenge comes that lots of gin at the moment is, dare I say it, marketing led with ever increasing fancy bottles and gilded packaging. That in itself you know the liquid in there um may or may not be any good but the package certainly is not very friendly and um that that will have to be a change in consumer behavior you know and that's probably a change across luxury goods as much as anything as much as anything else um so it can certainly lead the way i don't think it's any harder than others and this you know it, um Albiki Distillery does great things. You know, it's producing climate neutral, carbon neutral or negative gin. So it, it's easy for brands, not easy. It, brands are doing it and it can be done, therefore. Excellent. OK. Um, and then just sort of moving on to looking ahead a little bit. And um, you, in fact, John, you touched on this at the start, which is that um, uh, some drinks retailers that I've spoken to have said they've seen a move back um, by consumers to the big well-established brands in gin uh, and perhaps because these producers have had to rethink their strategies a little bit to compete with the new wave of cross spirits of gin which has been going on for the last few years so thinking about Bombay Sapphire which announced recently it's 100% sustainable botanicals and other brands Tanqueray and Gordon's doing a bit of activity there do you think if I, if I start with you John you, you mentioned it but do, do you think that it was just a response to the pandemic where people go for trusted brands in a in a sort of panic situation um or do you think this is going to be the future that it doesn't really matter whether a brand is big or small it's the ones that get get those messages right that will survive what's your feeling on on that balance um, I think it comes down to education again. And, you know, if you look at, I suppose, Bombay is a good example. You know, you know, if you go to their distillery at Laverstock, they've done the big piece. You know, they've got the glass greenhouse. And they're talking about you know, the sourcing of botanicals and stuff like that. So it comes down to actually talking to the consumer and, and the customer and actually educating them. Um, I think the, the fact that we've seen people going back into sort of the major brands like Tanqueray, Gordon's, et cetera, will be predominantly down to um, be then consumers see them as a trusted brand. And again, you know, they've, you know, promoted heavily on TV, you know, they've, they've communicated the message, you know, Tanqueray's have been on TV, you know, Gordon's have launched a number of different flavor variants over the last year. Um, so, and again, these are brands that also have bigger pack formats. So 70 CL, one liters, et cetera, where a, a lot of the other gym brands might not necessarily have the larger pack formats. So they, they would have seen the better benefit from consumer trends move into larger formats um i mean i suppose going back to the next point you know there's a fine line between you know is it all about just ethical botanicals you know and, it, and is that the right thing you know you know a big part of this is is the, is the base spirit so you know are they buying their base spirit in are they making their own mm. base spirit where they're getting the grain or the barley to make the base spirit 
you know, look at the packaging. I mean, I can see in years to come that, you know, when you look at all the more whiskies bottles that we sell with cartons and cartonettes, actually won't have cartonettes anymore because actually nine times out of 10, what happens? You get home, you unpack it, the bottle, put a bottle in your, your cupboard and then you've got a tube that's useless. So yeah. actually, why, 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 are we, why are we going to that format? Would it not be better that if you're buying it as a gift that somebody gives you a free bottle bag? So I can see consumer trends changing as we look more into waste packaging. You know, the uh, Scottish um, refuse scheme that's going to be coming into operation, whether they bring that into, you know, Northern Ireland, England and Wales, you know, will we have the same scheme? There's going to be more and more pressure put onto the recycling, use of materials, you know, does it have a foil cap? Is it a cork cap? Is it, you know, screw cap? Mm. All that sort of stuff. So I think, you know, Nick said, you know, three, four, five years time down, you know, right road, you know, we'll be having a completely different conversation mm. because we'll be in a completely different place. I think what COVID has done, though I say, is given more, tea, more time for people to actually look at this stuff and actually mm. research more and actually understand, you know, if that's my little local distillery. So what they're doing going online, actually being able to go and visit the distillery perhaps yeah. um, and, and actually and learn more. So mm. I don't think it's a bad thing. I don't think we have the answers yet. And I think it will continue to evolve. Yeah. You know? And I've seen it in, in different areas I worked in where we do one thing one year because we think that's the right thing to do. But actually, as you research and understand more, changing one thing has a knock on effect for three or four other things that actually might not be ethically right. Mm. they be right so you have to backtrack and actually go down a different route so mm. I, I think i think we will just learn more um and i think it's a good thing and yeah. i think you know provided we're willing to learn by our mistakes and hopefully we don't make too many mistakes along the way it'll be a good thing it's um it's interesting that you were talking about that it's a, a conversation that seems to be coming up a lot more in in the wine world at the moment is the the bottle and the glass and the packaging and the light weighting of, of bottles and the, the difference in the weight between just two very similar looking wine bottles, which I think is a conversation that's not really happening so much in spirits um, in the same way, uh, it, as in, in in the wider perspective that consumers can understand um, th that side of things. Although there is work being done by producers to have different packaging for for spirits, which hopefully, like you say, will be a conversation we can have again in a in a in a few years' time. Um, James, what what do you feel about this this topic? Is it um, with the brands that you stock at Jeroboam's? Are you are you finding that people are looking for trusted brands or big or small brands, or is it something yeah? That will continue? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, with the bigger brands, there's a kind of an implicit trust that because the liquid is good and the kind of story about the brands is good, that they are like good behind the scenes with all the kind of decisions they're making about, you know, the ethical and sustainable kind of parts of their business. Um, I, just don't, I think that there is, there's a, a, a greater kind of consumer awareness about packaging in particular. I mean, you mentioned in the wine trade, so Runar, for example, launching their second skin, um, you know, historically had gigantic cumbersome packaging mm. um, that's made not just of like cardboard, but there's bits of plastic and whatever. Moving to a lightweight packaging made from recycled material is good. I think uh, Nick brought up the example of Brukladich as being like a, a company that is on the right track, you know, having recently offered consumers um, purchasing from their web store the opportunity to forego um, the carton, uh, which I think is, is a really important step to take. I think they're sort of slowly coming out is perhaps the model for medium to larger brands, um, the model for how others would perhaps go about ensuring that their business is making the right kind of choices as opposed to kind of just using you know, as, as Nick said as well, kind of green, using the kind of environmental, sustainable, kind of ethical things as a, as a form of greenwashing um, that, you know, if you're being sort of cynical, could say that if, if there's a, tr a consumer trust place in those brands already, like doing small things such as, you know, uh, sustainable, using sustainable bot botanics, whatever that kind of means, 
it's going to cement that the brand in there in the consumer's eyes you know mm. um so i th yeah i think that there's a great awareness on the part of consumers for packaging and those sorts of uh, issues as being um a small decision that is actually can have quite a big kind of impact um we're certainly seeing that with our customers in store um yeah, yeah. <clears throat> And um, just just uh, moving over to you, Nick. It, it sounds <clears throat> it sounds like you know it's a difficult job for retailers to be able to sort of trust these, but understand which are the brands that are, are ticking all of these boxes or as many of them as, as they can. And it's an, a learning process for buyers as well. But saying that, you've you've all highlighted some really interesting examples as as we've carried on through this conversation. Do you, do you think that retailers working with you and others can kind of pass those messages on to consumers now that we're doing a lot more online and virtual education? Is, is there an opportunity with the new way that we that we are as consumers to, to highlight those brands? Um, uh, yes, there is an opportunity. Whether it will be grasped, I don't, I don't know. Um, if we're being, you know, part of the reason people went to big brands, yes, some of them are trusted, absolutely. And I, uh, and this isn't a tirade at big brands by any stretch of the imagination, but they also have big money and they pay for every promotional slot and they pay for TV and they buy that space and they buy some of that loyalty. And that is one way to encourage consumers and consumers come in, they try their product, they like it, they stay. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. And all buyers are trying to offer a commercially uh, attractive range of products to bring in customers and, and uh, retain them. Ideally, if they can get them in on an exclusive basis, that'd be perfect too. Um, the the on-trade is a long way ahead. Uh, you know, bartenders and purchasers there, you know, they're demanding uh, data. They're asking impact uh, status of, of brands lots of them based on a co2 footprint um and that's new we haven't been asked for that before um so we're we're doing that and as i say we've got a business that's removing glass from from the supply chain in in, in total right um and and there's you know there's options there for retailers and you can see it you know waitrose have done it with their naked range in other areas you know they people are doing it um but as, as these guys have both said, you know, it relies on the consumers to do that. Is is it the job of a retailer to communicate all of these messages to to customers? I'm, I'm not sure it is. I think they can help facilitate the transfer of information. It's easier for James, if you like, in his stores. He's got great staff who who spend time talking to customers who want to know. It's much harder in a major retailer where people walk past and and put stuff in their in their in their trolley and, and waitress do a good job of, of trying to communicate through you know magazines press and, and everything else um i think that it's uh the job of everybody to to make sure it happens right i don't think it falls on any one thing i think the one thing to do is to make sure that um those so some of the good practice comes from the smaller smaller producers it's really easy for them uh, comparatively easy for them to do um and especially if they're starting from scratch. Um, but, you know, the big boys are making making efforts as well. And I think all of it should generally be applauded. Um, but we, we, you know, myself, my brands, you know, my retail partners, we've probably all got a job to do. But it's only relevant mm. if people start to change their buying habits. The data and research tells you it's coming. Um, and it's already started across a whole range of categories. So... I, I, I personally think the message is worth worth trying now. Mm, but the liquid has to be good. <laughs> I want to come back to that. Yeah, that's good. Um, now we've got time for a, a quick question that's come in that, that relates to this. Um, so I'll just ask it now and and see who wants to pick that up. Um, it's uh, to do with the um, packaging of a product, which is that um, Research some time ago by Professor Charles Spence demonstrated that consumers associate the weight of the bottle or other packaging with quality of product. This is a conversation that's also come up in, in wine yep. um, and they will accordingly pay more. How does the panel suggest changing minds on this point? 
and put up your hand if anyone wants to answer that question as we finish off. John? Uh, I think it's, an issue, it's time, isn't it? And, it? and again, it comes down to education. And I suppose, you know, if you look at wine as a good example, how many years ago was it that you got a screw cap and everybody went, oh, that's cheap. Mm. You, know, you get a screw cap wine, that's, that's going to be cheap quality wine. But actually, it gives you better closure in some cases versus cork. Actually preserves the wine better. And actually over a period of time and actually with a lot of, you know, can I say it more top end wines actually moving down to screw cap as well. You know, you can educate consumers, you can educate customers and actually with the knowledge of like wine specialty and waitress and the team of people that James has in his stores as well, you can talk to the consumer and you can educate people. I think at the same time, it also has to be, it can't be based on just the retailers. You know, you, you need to have pressure from consumers when it comes down to packaging formats and stuff like that, but actually pushing tools, actually saying, well, do I need this packaging? Do I need this cardboard sleeve? And actually pushing back a little bit. I mean, I just, it's funny, this morning I had a couple of boxes delivered here and literally for one bottle, I had probably six or seven bits of different packaging to protect it. And I sort of sat there going, you know, is it really necessary? You know, you know, and one, do I need a full bottle? Because I've not just been given a five CL bottle. So, you know, I think a lot of it will come down to the pressure from the from the consumers and the, and the trade, mm -hmm. actually pushing back to the retailers to be able to do something properly or mm -hmm. something different. And I think, you know, moving our business, I mean, I know the work that Karen Gray and her team do from a packaging point of view and actually looking at, you know, removing black plastics as an example and all the pressure that we put on our supply base to actually be making sure that they're doing the right thing. Um, so... <laughs> It, there's, there's not a one shoe fits all, unfortunately. I think it comes down to everybody playing their bit and, and doing their role. Um, mm. If James or Nick agree, or yeah, I, I would, I would definitely agree. I think, yeah, the consumer, the pressure upwards from the consumer is is important, and that, like you say, comes through education. I think it's important for um, businesses, whether they be retailers, you know, wholesalers, or the producers themselves. To be making making these kind of business decisions, so to remove packaging or, or these kind of things, like on their own merit, you know, um, I think that if if you start bottling, you sell, you know, like shipping out a, a whiskey or whatever, without the packaging and the lighter bottle, and are communicating to your customers, who can then in turn communicate to their customers why it is like this, then you know. That, that's that's a positive but i think there needs to be more producers and brands t making that effort themselves um and kind of leading the way um than just waiting for you know a kind of change in general uh, public opinion that then feeds back you know to the retailers and then back upwards through the chain um i think there has to be a proactive approach to this yeah well, it, it, um, it sounds like, as, as Nick was saying, that change is coming and, and hopefully spirits and, and drinks as a whole will be near the forefront of, of the change as consumers demand it. And as you're saying um, there, James, it, it, it will take some producers being brave to um, perhaps be more proactive as consumers are, are looking more for that. Um, but uh, that, that sort of comes to the end of our discussion. We've, we've touched on lots of interesting points there. Thanks, thanks for your time. Um, thank you everyone for watching and thank you to the panel. Um, thanks for all your time. Hopefully at our next Think Gin event, we can be um, do it live and enjoy a drink together afterwards. <laughs> so thank you all. Mm -hmm.